Okay, so again, moving along with the a rural connection theme, we have another speaker, a scientist, uh, Dr. James Wagan. He's going to talk about the temporal and spatial development of total electron content enhancements during substorms. And um, again, for total electron content, you can think of that as the total number um, of electrons in the ionosphere uh, between the ground and a GPS satellite in space. So that will very much affect radio frequencies. And substorms is a very specific type of auroral activity or auroral enhancement. So uh, James, take it away. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Super. I we will just... try and share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? It's starting. Can you see my presentation? I can. Yes. Awesome. Perfect, you are set to go. Okay, so I don't have my camera on. There's a picture of me in the lower right, left corner, so you know what I look like. Uh, you don't want to have my camera on anyway. I'm sitting at home. Okay, so my talk is on TEC enhancements. Many of us in the space physics community say that TEC enhancements disrupt communications or GPS systems. This is important because we don't want to have these types of disruptions, but many of these disruptions occur in the, the higher latitudes potentially due to particle precipitation into the ionosphere. And before I get started into this, I just want to define TEC as total electron content. It is the number of electrons per square area along a column of the atmosphere. In this case, one TEC unit is equal to 10 to the 16th electrons per square meter. And what I'm showing here in the lower right corner is one of these TEC, TEC enhancements that occurred within Alaska during a substorm. You can see this very large jump here of about 10 TEC units. And so this is a very large jump indeed. And what is not really well known at this time is where these enhancements occur within the auroral oval, as in what type of, of current system do these TEC enhancements occur? And so what I'm gonna basically try and show you today is that the TEC enhancements I see are associated with region one current system or high latitude current system within the auroral oval. Uh, I was asked to define what a substorm is because this is when I'm seeing these TEC enhancements. The substorm is basically a release of energy in the magneto tail dumping energy into the ionosphere. And so here we're looking at the earth uh, over on the left side of the top figure towards the sun is off to the left. And when the plasma expands off the sun, it stretches the earth's magnetic field and those stretch magnetic field lines can reconnect, dump energy from the magnetic field into the particles those particles can rush towards the Earth, follow the magnetic field lines, and dump energy into the ionosphere, creating this bright aurora that you see down here in the lower right corner. And so the talk today is going to cover several different sources of data. One is that I'm using a number of auroral onsets determined from all sky image data observed in Canada. I'm trying to show a mosaic of one of these all sky uh, cameras arrays up in Canada. You can see the aurora here going from Alaska all the way across Canada to eastern Canada. You see a substorm occurring within uh, or a sudden brightening within the aurora occurring in central Canada. The red line here is indicating local midnight. Substorms typically occur just before local midnight. And the coordinate system here we're looking at is a geographic coordinate system. One of the other data sets I'll use is an ionospheric uh, current pattern a two-dimensional current pattern across uh, North America, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. I'm also looking at TEC maps uh, covering all the world. These are provided by the modular data set, and I'll talk about those more in a minute. And then the final data set that I'm looking at is the DMSP, or Defense Meteorological Space Program uh, spacecraft, particularly the precipitating electrons and ions and the magnetometer data. Uh, defense meteorological uh, space program is important because uh, typically in these orbits we have one crossing from pre-midnight to, uh, to uh, I'm sorry, from uh, pre-noon to pre-midnight, which is exactly where these substorms occur. And then nowadays we actually have two within the same orbit. And so we can have one pass before a substorm and one pass just after a substorm and look at the change within the precipitation in the magnetic field. And so I just want to talk about these other data sets. One is this ionospheric current system. 
what I'm doing is I'm using magnetometer data from 11 different uh, arrays across North America and, and Greenland up here. Typically, I have data from about 60 to 90 stations contributing to two-dimensional patterns of the ionospheric currents, which I'll show in a second. But I have the potential of getting data from 150 different magnetometers. The resolution of the currents that I'm going to be looking at, specifically the current amplitudes, which is a proxy for the theodoline currents or currents that come into or out of the ionosphere, is one and a half degrees by three and a half degrees. And the temporal resolution of the currents I produce is 10 seconds, but I can go as high as one second resolution. And so in this plot here, what I'm trying to show is a quick look picture of the different current patterns I can pull up. First, in the upper uh, part of the plot, you can see the equivalent ionospheric currents. These are horizontal to the ionosphere. The dots here indicate where current has been determined. The direction and magnitude of the vector indicate the direction and magnitude of the current. P is in the lower right. Uh, each star here indicates a magnetometer that has data that was good for that particular day. And I've plotted here, or, or indicated here, the westward electrojet starting over here in eastern Canada, going across Canada and ending over here in Alaska. And the bar here marks again local magnetic midnight. Down below that is the current amplitudes. These are currents that are perpendicular to the ionosphere or proxy to the theodoline currents. You can see blue is downward current coming into the ionosphere if you're looking down on the Earth. Red is coming up out of the ionosphere if you're looking down on the Earth. And I've indicated two different current patterns, region one, the blue, in region two, the red. And this is very typical for the dawn side of the auroral region. And just quickly to, to pl uh, plug my own data set here, I've been producing these currents now for over 10 years. I have about 10 years worth of data online. If you want to use it, please feel free to use it. If you're trying to determine open closed field line boundaries, the uh, upper or poleward version of the region one current system is a good way to indicate the open closed field line boundary. And these currents can also provide context for what you're looking at in terms of uh, scintillations or TECs. Now quickly to go through the uh, TEC measurements. So to get TEC measurements, you use a GPS receiver on the ground and you use one of the GPS spacecraft. In this case, you're looking at a radio wave from the transmitter down to the ground, and you're looking at how the uh, radio waves change in speed as they pass through the, the ionosphere. And if you know the distance to your, between your receiver and your transmitter, and if you know the, the frequency that's being uh, transmitted, you can actually pull out the electron content along that column of atmosphere you're going through. And typically, that's initially called a slant TEC, then you can rotate that based on the angle between the transmitter and the receiver to get what's called a vertical TEC, so something vertical to the surface of the Earth. And down below here, I'm showing a map of those TECs. The red portion here indicates the day side. So 180 degrees away is the night side in North America here. You can see the auroral region is green band at high latitude. The blue part here is called the middle latitude trough where there's a depletion in the electrons in the ionosphere. And down below that in South America here, you can actually see what's called the electron fountain. The day side electrons can be pulled up high into the ionosphere. As those electrons move into the night side of the earth, they actually kind of wane back down along the magnetic field lines, which you know is a dipole configuration down onto the ionosphere, creating this kind of uh, two banded effect over here in the night side. So what I want to do first is go through one particular event, then I want to go through some statistics, and then we'll all be done. What I'm looking at here is a specific uh, um, substorm event that occurred in October 14, 2012. I'm looking at four distant snapshots of the auroral mosaics across Canada. You can see the uh, different all-sky image cameras here. Plotted on top of that is the um, current amplitudes, where red again is the upward currents, blue again is the downward currents, and the local midnight is indicated with the, the red bar here in the upper left corner. I've also plotted the DMSP F-17 spacecraft sitting here right within the aurora just before the substorm occurrence. In the upper uh, right corner, you can see the substorm has occurred in central Canada. F-17 has moved out into the Pacific. 
F16, which is following along the same orbital path as F17, is approaching that substorm onset. Down in the lower left corner, you can see now F16 is sitting within the auroral onset, and the currents around that onset have actually intensified. In the lower right corner, you can now see that F16 has moved along the same trajectory as F17 and moved out into the Pacific Ocean. And so if I have these two spacecraft, I can actually begin to look at how the particle precipitation changes for that uh, single event. Before I do that, what I'll look at here is quickly the TECs. They are not as informative as I had hoped, but we can quickly see some features here. Here we have a TEC map over North America with a geographic coordinate system. The star here indicates where the auroral onset occurred. You can see a lot of gaps here because we just don't have enough GPS receivers in Canada. In the next plot on the right over here, you see the TECs after the onset. You can see some enhancement in Northern Alaska, some enhancement just around the region of the star, but it's not very convincing. And so what I do in the next plot is I look at the median of the TECs scattered around this uh, overall onset location to try and bring out this TEC enhancement. What we're looking at here in the bottom portion of this plot is the VTEC or median TEC values around the location of the overall onset. I define the area here in the upper left portion of the plot. The dark uh, black line in the center indicates when the onset occurs. And you can see the TECs are low before the onset and then jump up a few minutes after the onset. Above that, I'm plotting the BX component of the magnetic field, the magnetometer closest to the overall onset. And I'm just plotting this here because this sharp drop in the BX component after the onset is a very good indicator that an auroral onset or substorm has occurred within the uh, auroral region. So now let us quickly look at the particles. This is uh, particle and magnetometer data from F17 that occurred before the substorm. Uh, from the left to right, we're crossing from the dawn side of the aurora down into the pre-midnight sector. The top, the dark black line is indicating the cross-component magnetic field. I've indicated here the different uh, current, uh, upward or downward, uh, for the different dark changes in the, the magnetometer. Over here on the left side, you can see what's associated with the dawn and upward and downward current. And then we can see over on the right side, the down, up, down, up configuration, which is associated with the pre-midnight current system. In the second, the bottom and bottom panels, we're looking at the electron precipitation and the ion precipitation. First, the electrons are plotted from low energy to high energy on the y-axis, and the ions are plotted from high energy to low energy. So it's kind of like a butterfly distribution. What's important here is that you see the electrons are what's associated with closed magnetic field line precipitation across the entire time span. And this dashed line, vertical line here on the far right side, indicates the closest approach of the spacecraft to the overall onset location. And what I see is a very typical pattern for closed field line precipitation. The ions, unfortunately, are contaminated, and so we don't get a very clear picture of what's happening here. But you can see that there is some closed field line precipitation of the ions occurring. In the next plot, we're looking at DMSP F16. This occurred right after, about eight minutes after F-17 passed through the aurora. At the top, you can see almost the exact same arrangement of the currents. You have the up-down associated with the dawn side and the down-up-down -down configuration of the currents associated with the pre-midnight region. Again, in our electrons and ions, we see very similar precipitation occurring where the dark line indicates when the onset or the substorm onset has occurred. But then this dotted line here indicates the closest approach of the spacecraft to the aurora onset location. And what you see is a very bright red enhancement within the electrons. And I'll go back to the F-17. You can see the dashed line is not much going on. And then we go back to DMSV F-16. There's this sharp enhancement that occurs within the electrons. And maybe a little bit in the ions, but it's not entirely clear. Four minutes. Well, thanks. So the, uh, 
those are nice to show the enhancement as a, as a nice pretty picture, but what we really want is numbers. And so what I'm looking at here is the differential energy flux at each one of those dashed line locations for F17 on the left side and F16 on the right side. And what we see here is that there is a jump in the differential electron flux for these two different time spans on the order of a factor of 100. And so the electron fluxes have increased considerably during this uh, single event. What I want to do now is look at the statistics. And by doing this, I'm going to combine many of those role onsets that I had and make a two-dimensional superposed epoch analysis. What I use is the epoch onset time is zero, zero epoch time. And the, epoch, uh, the onset location is an epoch zero location. And I take all the onsets between 22 and 23 MLT and I rotate them or shift them up and down in latitude and all line them up on top of each other to create one median picture of the currents and the TECs. So what I've done is combined about uh, 40 events here to create a picture of what I see in the field line like currents. I've got a two-dimensional plane flattened to the north magnetic pole. I'm showing things oriented with uh, midnight at the bottom, noon at the top, dawn side on the right, and dusk side on the left. And what I see is a very typical current pattern before the overall onset, where blue is downward current, red is upward current. The little dot here indicates my epoch zero location. Over on the dusk side, we see upward current and downward current uh, from high latitude to low latitude. And the first two upper left plots show the currents before the onset, whereas the far upper right plot shows the currents at the auroral onset time. And you can see that the currents here are beginning to enhance. Then when we drop to the bottom left corner, we can see these currents really begin to enhance. They actually begin to expand poleward, eastward, and westward, just as we would see with the aurora. And as we move from five minutes after the onset all the way over to 20 minutes after the onset, the currents are really intensified. And so now these changes that I've done to the currents, these rotations left, right, up, and down to line up the currents is exactly what I've done to the TPCs. And so the same thing has been done in both cases before the onset, during the onset, and after the onset. Now what I've done is I've plotted contours from the currents on top of the TPCs with the TPCs of the colors in the background. And the contours here are the currents blue downward, mauve upward and white indicates my epoch zero location. And you can actually see the aurora oval here within the TECs before the onset in the upper two left. And after the onset has occurred, you can see this sharp enhancement in the TECs. And so really the question for you in the audience is, do these sharp enhancements during substorm disrupt radio communication? Is this something that is observed by you in the uh, ham science community? And I'd love to know. I don't, I've never seen any study indicating what this actually happens. If we look at the bottom row here, we can see this enhancement continues on for at least about another 20 minutes. We can see it expand both poleward, a little bit equatorward, and actually to the east and west. And what you can see also from all these plots here is that this enhancement is occurring within the region one current system. Region one current system is associated with the plasma sheet in the magneto tail where the region two current system is associated with the inner magnetosphere. And so the picture I'm trying to flesh out here is I think I see TEC enhancements within the onset, within the first 10 minutes of the onset. I see these enhancements within the region one current system. They last about 40 minutes in length. And then when we looked at the single event, the, what we seem to see is that the electron precipitation enhances by a factor of 10 to 100. And this seems to be associated with monoenergetic or broadband electron precipitation, which I just didn't have time to discuss. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, James. I really appreciate that.